some of life must be devoted to living itself. Some of life must be devoted to doing something worthwhile with, with one's life, not just to perpetuating it. This is, of course, how people quite rightly justify spending taxpayers' money on the arts and on conserving rare species. But sometimes when we justify academic science on those grounds, people get rather philistine and say things like, oh, so you think the government should spend money on your scientific research because your research is fun for you, do you? Fun isn't really the right word, is it? After sleeping for 140 million centuries, we have finally woken up in the universe. We've opened our eyes on a wonderful planet filled with color, teeming with life. Before very long, we shall have to close our eyes again. Finding out about the universe in which we've woken up, answering questions like, what are we doing here? What is this universe in which we've woken up? What is life and what, if anything, is it for? Surely the enterprise that answers questions like that, science, deserves a better title than fun. Put like that, doesn't science sound to you like just about the most worthwhile way in which you could possibly spend your short time in the spotlight? Now, of course, if you spent all your time wandering around the world gasping at everything and saying how wonderful, how amazing, uh, I've woken up after 100 million, million centuries, what a trip, people would think you were a bit odd and you might even get arrested. We do, of course, have an ordinary life to get on with. We do have a living to earn. We've got to earn our living being a solicitor or a laboratory cleaner or something like that. But nevertheless, it is worthwhile also from time to time shaking off the anaesthetic of familiarity and awakening to the wonder that is really all around us all the time. So how are we going to shake off the anaesthetic? We can't actually go to another planet, but fortunately we don't need to because we can go to regions of our own planet which are so unfamiliar that they almost might be another planet. This is another planet. This is Jupiter. It's a fantasy picture of Jupiter conceived by the astronomer Carl Sagan. And he's imagining life forms that might live in the upper atmosphere of Jupiter called floaters. If there were life forms in Jupiter, they would be called Jovians. So let's use the word by Jovians for creatures on this Earth that are so odd that they might almost be from another planet. Here, for instance, is a deep sea fish. You would have to go on a long journey in a submarine or in a diving suit to see that fish. This is exactly the same species of fish. The only difference is that this has just had a meal and that hasn't. That's looking for a meal, as you can tell from its ravening jaws. These creatures look pretty monstrous to us. I suppose by their standards, we might be thought monstrous. This one is another deep sea fish. This has a luminous lure uh, made by bacteria, luminous bacteria, and it uses this as a bait to lure prey into its vicinity. It then slams its fishing rod down into the vicinity of its jaws, opens them, and gulps in the prey. A very weird, bijovian creature. We don't even have to go to the deep sea, as a matter of fact, to see pretty weird creatures. I was once attending a lecture by a colleague who worked on octopuses. And he said the fascination with octopuses is these are the Martians. And he meant that, look at this, this creature could easily be from Mars, couldn't it? Watch the color change. That creature, that cuttlefish, it's not an octopus, it's a cuttlefish, is changing color at will. Look at the waves of color falling over it. That's not shadows falling over it from outside. That's internally controlled by the animal, by its own nervous system. It's registering emotion, signaling to other creatures, others of its own species, by Jovian creature. We don't even have to go to the sea at all. These are all insects. They all have the same basic insect body plan, which they inherited from a common insect ancestor which lived about 350 million years ago. They all look like insects because they've inherited the, those attributes. They all have a head, a thorax, an abdomen, but in this case, it's enormously elongated to look like a stick. Here, the same body is flattened out in this bug. Again, the head, thorax, abdomen, uh, three pairs of legs, antennae, wings. Here, butterflies, the same basic body plan, pulled and stretched, kneaded into different shapes. 
but basically the same shape. They've never quite shaken off their ancestral influence. But we were talking about shaking off our anaesthetic of soporific familiarity. And another way to achieve the illusion of waking up on a distant planet is to shrink ourselves, to go on a different kind of journey to a much smaller scale than we're used to. This is a dust mite. It's the sort of thing that you've met often in the carpets of your own home but didn't know it. It's hugely magnified by an instrument like this, which is a scanning electron microscope. And we can use the scanning electron microscope just as though it was a telescope pointing at some distant planet. So strange are the sights that it shows us. I think we have a volunteer to work the electron microscope. Now your name is? Louise. Louise. Do sit down, Louise. Now, on the screen at the moment, we have what looks like a jungle. We can think of it as a jungle on another planet. Now, you know how to work the joystick and navigate around. You also know how to zoom out and in. Um, what about zooming out and seeing what this jungle really is? OK, let's go slowly. Now, there's some curious rounded objects there. Go further. Two little patches of rounded objects. Go further. Go on. Right, now I think what we're seeing is the head of a mosquito. There are the compound eyes, lots of different facets of the compound eyes on either side. In the middle are the sockets of the antennae. Zoom out further, and again. And there's the whole head. You can see the whole round head with the sockets for the antennae and the rounded compound eyes with all the different facets. Now perhaps we can navigate to a different insect. Yes, the machine has been pre-programmed to move now to a different part of this strange landscape. And I hope we're going to see something else in a minute. What's this here? Looks like another jungle. Um, so let's move around and explore what we think it is. Oh, I can't see anything yet. Ah, oh, wait a minute. Let's zoom out a bit and see whether we can see better then. Again, again. Oh, that's looking like something. I think that's a pair of wings on, off to the left side, isn't it? So I think that might be the thorax of an insect of some sort. Let's try moving that way and see what we see. Other way. Might speed it up a little bit. That's right. Ah, it's the abdomen of a bee, I would think. Go on. More. Now, what's that? There's something curious poking out. Try and steer your way around so that's in the middle. Other way. And then down a bit. Now zoom into it. Keep, I'll keep steering, shall I? Right, zoom in. Need a bit of focus, I think. Can we do that? It looks to me like the head of something else. Zoom out again. What that is, as a matter of fact, is a tiny parasite. Thank you very much indeed, Louise. It's a tiny insect parasite called a strepsipteran, which is parasitizing a bee, and what you saw was the strepsipteran poking out below the armor plating of the bee there. There's its compound eyes, and there's its body, and that is one armor plate of the bee.